Hey everyone, it's me, Arthur Cade, and welcome back to Behind the Velvet Rope. On this episode, we take you inside some of the hottest events in film, TV, and theater. We are chatting with the cast of Eye in the Sky, Eclipsed, Better Call Saul, Blackish, and more, so stay tuned. Eye in the Sky is a topically relevant movie, giving a look at modern-day drone warfare and the tough decisions that soldiers face every day. We were at the New York premiere to chat with the cast. This is a change of pace for you, this colonel. What drew you to this role? The script, the story. You know, it's um, sometimes you want to do a, a, a a film because you love the character and you think, oh, I could really do something with that character, as with the Hedda Hopper in, in Trumbo. This is very different. It's not about the character. She fulfills a role within the, um, within the story of the film. And, and that was, it was the story of the film and the way in which that story is told that I thought was absolutely fascinating. Um, it, and, you know, a, a really complete script is a very rare thing. You, you very often read a script and you think, well, that's interesting, but I wonder what they'll do with the next draft or the third or the fourth draft. With this script, it was perfect. It arrived. What you see on the screen was more or less what I read. It, it, it was what I read in, in, in the very first uh, version that I read of it. So it, that was why I wanted to do it. And also I felt that it has the possibility of going into the canon of hopefully great war movies, but certainly good war movies. This movie, I heard it's awesome. I can't wait to see it after this premiere. You get to work with this incredible lady right behind me. Yeah, she's pretty phenomenal. <laughs> yeah. This movie touches on a subject that's so relevant today. Yes. Decisions that are being made that affect people's lives. What drew you to this and getting involved with it? Uh, really just that, you know. Um, I always love to do projects that raises some sort of questions that we all want answers to. Um, the script was phenomenal from page one to the very end. It was just an edge of your seat thriller and I felt that reading it. And I'm, of course, was a huge fan of Gavin, our fearless leader, our director, and Helen Mirren, when they approached me with this, this project, she was already attached and, you know, it was impossible to say no, so that's that. You have this meteoric rise on one of the greatest shows of all time. Now you've really transitioned to film. And I'm going to ask you about the path because I yeah. can't wait to see that as well. But what's it been like walking away from Breaking Bad and transitioning into the film world? Um, you know, it's been phenomenal. I've been doing this for so long. And uh, what Breaking Bad did for me, not only me, but really everyone involved in that show, it just opened up so many doors for us. And so it's been a fun ride, man. You know, I I've been wanting to do this my whole life. And so it's really, truly a dream come true. It's not only become one of television's most popular shows, but also one of its most viral on social media. We spoke with the cast of Fox's Scream Queens at Paley Fest Los Angeles, including Leah Michelle, Jamie Lee Curtis, and more. I'm tripping right now. <laughs> you got Jamie Lee Curtis I know, it's, it's, you. It's, it's, By the way, the only person you've ever met who literally turns on her own light. I mean, you know, that, you know what you need. And you it's know what? like, I see the light, it's not like, on. Wait, and let by me the get way, my it's going right. really high. You're like, let Jamie's me get like her own production crew today. Setting. She's like her own production crew. Is that how she is Listen, on set? Listen, she's a woman of many, many traits. And all good. It seems like you guys are having a blast on oh, this show. Talk to me about being part of it and what can people expect heading into season two. It's been such an amazing experience. Season one was fantastic. We shot in New Orleans. And that was a really bonding experience for all of us, being away from home and being in a new place. Um, and now next year we're going to be filming in L.A. So we'll see what happens there. This show, it feels like, really connects with the millennials. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about some of the fun reactions you've had from your younger fans. I think that the funniest one was when they said that when Ariana was being killed that she was still tweeting at the exact same time and that's such a scary thing to think about but I thought it was one of the funniest moments on the show. You know what the thing I've taken away from this red carpet tonight, you guys have some fun together. I oh, can we, tell it's we a like great each cast. other. We like each other and we haven't seen each other. So all of these people have been, you know, doing the work they do off of the show. 
you know, each one, Niecy Nash literally has been in every television show that has been made in the last year. Uh, you know, this one wrote three books, that one's made six movies. It's a little nutty. When you look at this show, this is such a great change of pace for you. And you get to work with some of the best young actresses in I the do. business. Talk to me about getting to work with them. They're bringing the millennial audience in. Well, they're bringing the millennials, but the reason is, is because of the writing. You cannot diminish the quality of the writing we all, the reason we're all here is because of the writing. It's not because of really what we do, it's because the writing is so strong and it's, each part has been written for each of us. So that's unusual. One of the things I love with this show is the social media response is off the charts. What mm -hmm. have been some of the really cool fan responses you've gotten from the show? Um, well, Billy and I have been shipped as like a like a ship on like a an OTP one true pair like friendship goal called Bill Gale, That's and it's awesome. become like a hashtag, and there are literal like accounts dedicated to our friendship that just like post our Snapchats, and like they're just like moms, like we love you, like well, you're the best, and it's just so cool like that they like love our friendship like so much, and they love the show too, and it's just it's really strange to see that, but um, really cool. And um, the outpouring of support for Chanel number five, who's constantly made fun of in season one. <laughs> um, they're like, we, we feel so bad for you. Like, I'd like you on Tinder. And I'm like, thank you. <laughs> You've had so many great guest stars, and there's been so many rumors about what's gonna happen in season two and who might be joining. Who's one guest star that you would die to have on the show? Justin Bieber. I like that. And also like, like Mer uh, Ice T from like SVU, what like a strange dynamic from Justin Bieber to Ice T. <laughs> imagine, but like imagine that. Like just think about it in your head, and He's you'll agree. Like I love Ice T in SVU is my favorite show. So like maybe a Screen Queens SVU crossover. <laughs> this show, ton of fun. Season two, what can everybody expect? A ton more fun. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see. You guys are moving to a hospital, I hear. We're moving to a hospital. My dream. Finally being fulfilled. <laughs> yeah. What I love about the show, you never know if you're going to live or die. So no. when you get that script, what's the first thing you do? Flip to the end, <laughs> find my name. <laughs> the, the fan response to the show has been insane, especially on social media and people watching it after the live broadcast. It's been awesome. It's so crazy. It's been such a surreal experience. It's awesome. What's been the most fun reaction you've gotten? Getting called mom. And I just made a joke about it on the show, and then it actually started happening. <laughs> that was crazy. <laughs> Jamie Lee Curtis was talking about how Nisi Nash is on every show. Is this one of your favorites? <laughs> yes. This is one of my favorites. Playing Mama Denise? What? It's a, this is a good time. This show, I love. It's got comedy. It's got horror. It's got drama. What drew you to it when you first got the script? What you was know, like to be honest with you, Ryan had me at hello. You know, Ryan Murphy calls, like and, and you just say yes. You know, I hadn't even seen the script. He said, I got a part that I think you would be good for. And I said, okay. And then I, I said, I, I'm in. And then I said, oh, wait, what do I have to do? So I said yes before I even knew. Opening night of Broadway's newest hit show, Eclipse, was a momentous occasion on all fronts. We chatted all about it with star Lupita Nyong'o, playwright Denai Guerrera, and the celebrity guests. I saw the show last night, absolutely loved it. Talk to me about why did you get involved with this? Well, because in 2009, I understudied this, the role I play, and I was just so moved by the story that Denai had told. I'd never seen a story about African women told in this way, and I just felt like, well, I have to do this. And I felt like it was a kind of play that opened up a world that otherwise people would not know about. I didn't know anything about Liberia when I understudied the, the role. And, and what I learned from this play was so meaningful because I learned it through emotions, not just facts. And uh, I think that's the best way for things to resonate with people and for change to come. We are living in a world right now where, especially in Hollywood, there's a diversity issue. So putting a product like this out there into the world, what type of great message, talk to me about that message, that does it send to not only Broadway but Hollywood in general? I guess it sends the message, I mean, at the end of the day, this is a very good story, regardless of the color of skin. And it is a meaningful tale and uh, it is a human story. It's very specifically Liberian. 
but it captures the universal. And that's what makes, that's a good story, when you can tell something specific and capture something universal. Opening night, standing ovation. What's going through your mind when you're on stage and you see the reaction from the crowd? Uh, it's a lot of gratitude and a lot of like, wow, really? Wow, this is amazing. I don't know what I did to deserve this type stuff. Yeah, but it's joy, a lot of joy. I saw the show last night. One of the things I love, this is serious subject matter, but you put some humor in there and I love it. Talk to me about injecting that humor and, and how it kind of doesn't soften it, but it cr makes the message more powerful, I think. Well, I think actually what it does is it deepens it. If you're laughing, you're going to cry kind of easily, too. Gets it in there even more deeply if you're laughing, right? Yeah. Because <laughs> then you're opening. So I don't want to dirge you. These women are not a dirge. They're not, they're not, they're full, complex, interesting, fascinating people. So I want to celebrate them. But in terms of what I want to do to an audience, I want you to be disarmed. Then they can really get in there. So yeah, I have to make you laugh and to make you cry. Well, the message it brings is power, it's empowerment. You have an all-female cast, female director, female writer, African-American producers on Broadway. It's so powerful and moving, and it's going to spark you know, a lot of conversation that needs to be had about what's going on around the world. So I'm really excited for that. In its first year, Better Call Saul became one of TV's biggest commercial and critical hits. We spoke to the stars at Paley Fest LA about what to expect in season two. This show, season two, when you break out of Breaking, Breaking Bad and then you have another hit like this based around your character as an actor, what's that experience like? Uh, incredibly rewarding. We all work hard at every job we do. Even the worst show on TV that gets canceled, everybody gave it their all. And uh, so, that sort of doesn't change from show to show, but to, for it to work like this has worked for the audience, everything has to come together and it's a rarity. It's very hard to achieve. It starts with the writers, Vince Gilligan and Peter Gould, and of course Vince Gilligan created a Breaking Bad. But he, he and Peter discovered this show. They didn't know what they were gonna write. They didn't know what it would be. They work hard to uh, make this an honest show and a rewarding one to watch, So, and it's unique. He's such a complicated character. He is. You're able to bring both your dramatic chops as well as your comedic chops uh -huh. to it. Talk to me about being able to intertwine that to create the complexity of Saul. Well, I mean, at the core of it is just be honest. You know, try to, try to play the moments as honestly as you can and simply. Sometimes Saul, or Jimmy McGill, as he is in this show, is, is running a game on the other person he's talking to. He's, he's lying to them, you know, in a manipulative way. And then you're kind of have this sense of the subtext, you know. But mostly you just look at everything that the character says and you realize that like a real person, he's going through his life and he's discovering each moment as it comes to him. And he's reacting in an honest way. Well, what he's got inside his heart and in his inspirations, he gets inspired by a lot of things, not always to his benefit. In fact, never to his benefit. People always say they love Saul because he's good at what he does. And I'm like, is he good at what he does? He's good in the moment. But then in the end, it doesn't always turn out. How incredible is it to see what the show has become? It's, uh, I'd like to say it was terribly surprising, but I don't believe that for a minute. Vince Gilligan's been one of my favorite writers for a long time. I was a huge Breaking Bad fan. And listen, I accepted this role without ever having seen a single word. I just knew it was going to be wonderful. And he just keeps making the characters deeper and deeper. And, and uh, we just keep climbing up on it and doing it. It's really fun. It seems like for you, Jonathan, Bob, the three, the triangle of characters, there's such a beloved reaction right now. Has it blown you away to see how much people love Chuck? Oh, I don't think they love Chuck. They like <laughs> I mean, my they like my work. <laughs> they they really they want to kill Chuck, and I understand this. But I think that uh, there are certain episodes coming up that it will not excuse all of his behavior, but it will explain it uh, to some extent. We will see a little deeper into what makes this guy and what makes this interesting relationship between these two brothers as complex as it is. Howard, 
what a unique character. We don't know if he's good. We don't know if he's bad. He's got an a-hole side to him. <laughs> it's got to be a pretty fun thing to play as an actor. Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, and uh, Vince and Peter had told me early on, you know, uh, as opposed to leaning into being, you know, snidely whiplash and curling your mustache sort of thing, he said, you know, keep in mind that Howard is uh, basically a good guy. You know, he's, he's a good guy. He sees the world that he's doing good, which doesn't mean what he does necessarily doesn't have bad actions for other people. There's no doubt about that. But I think Howard goes to bed at night and sleeps like a baby. Your relationship with Jimmy on the show, pretty freaking hilarious. Talk to me about the building of that relationship, the chemistry. Well, you know, uh, working with Bob is, is fantastic because he's, he just brings so much to the table. And to, to actually sit there live and watch him in Jimmy mode is so much fun because he can go off the rails and really get crazy. And Howard, of course, is much more straight-laced. So uh, the thing is, I think Howard wants to be Jimmy. I think Howard wants to let loose. He has an inner Jimmy in him somewhere, but he can't because, you know, he's Howard Hamlin. He's got his name on the wall. Coming off of Breaking Bad, you know, how many writers can hit two home runs in a row? Were you a fan of Breaking Bad and once, once Vince ends up announcing the show and you become part of it, are you like, we've got to deliver the goods on this one? I, I, I think I'm not the only actor that would say, <laughs> if you see Vince Gilligan's name or Peter Gould's name on a script, you say yes, probably before you even turn the first page. And that's how I feel about these guys. I trust them with my character's life. I trust them with this whole story arc. And, you know, they ask us to run blindfolded, you know, straight into the dark, because we as actors have no idea what's coming up from episode to episode. And every one of us just goes for it. And it's a fun roller coaster ride. Did you think this thing was going to do as well as it's doing? No, not at all. I mean, I, you know, one of the great moments for me was when folks stopped asking exclusively about when they were going to see Walt and Jesse. And they started asking about the characters who are from Better Call Saul, like, uh, like um, Kim Wexler, who's played by the beautiful Ray Seahorn. Or they've been asking about Nacho. They've been asking about the Kettlemans. And that's, that's, that's a wonderful thing that, that people are as into, this, into the characters on this show as they were uh, on the characters in Breaking Bad. What was the point when you knew that Saul could be his own spin-off character? I don't think we really knew until until people started telling us, uh, saying nice things to us like home run. Uh, we, all I can tell you is that we thought he'd be fun to write about. And that, that feeling dates back to probably, I'm being a little conservative here, probably season three of Breaking Bad, we started talking about it kind of, sort of, in earnest. Uh, is, that, is that fair to say? Peter, Peter uh, created the character as, a, as, as Walter White's so-called consigliere back in season two. A Breaking Bad, and we liked the guy from the get-go, but I think probably about a year or so after that, we started joking about the idea of having a spin-off series. But even when uh, AMC and Sony very nicely said, you can go ahead and do it, only then did we start to think, gee, is this such a good idea? Maybe it's not, but, but luckily at that point it was too late. The Atlantic Theatre Company is one of New York's most prestigious off-Broadway institutions. We chatted with all of the celebrity supporters at their annual Actors Choice Gala. What brings the three of you to the Atlantic Theatre Gala tonight? An Uber, if we be very specific. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Chad, yeah. Chad, Chad our Uber driver, he's wonderful. From? Do you remember where he's from? Not from Chad. West no, he was not from Chad. Come on. West Indies, yeah. Uh, but no, and, and also a very prior to that, a kind invitation from Mary Steenburgen and Ted Danson. That's awesome. That's, uh, that, you know, and and here to support Atlantic Theater Company. And they're gonna sing. No Is that way. A no, no, no. Well, we've been get, we've been hearing who's singing tonight. Okay, okay. okay so you have to prepare me. Can he? Can they sing? They can the both sing very day. well. Ingrid Michaelson was just <laughs> telling me that she was rehearsing in her hotel room. Please tell me that he was rehearsing at home. In, in the Uber. In the Uber. We rehearsed in the Uber. <laughs> yeah, much to Chad's chagrin. Yeah. You guys obviously are doing The Last Man on Earth. You just joined the show, so what's it been like being, you and Jacob Tremblay was hilarious, so what's it been Thanks. like with being part of his show? Oh, fantastic. Yeah, I mean, we, you know, it, it's nice because we did it a few, several months ago now, like three months ago, so I forgot everything, so it's, it's nice to watch it again and be like, oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> and for you, this show has really blown up. It's obviously landed award nominations. What's it been like for you, Will? Oh man, it's it, it's very exciting to get to be in a position where you get to, do, you know, do what you do, to get to call the shots on something and, and have it turn out exactly 
how you want it to. So it's it's been great, a, a ton of work, but but uh, it's still, all worth it. And yet still calling the shots and still maintaining your friendships and making new ones. <laughs> That's hard. Which is very there. impressive. <laughs> Atlantic Theater Gala. Yeah. What brings you here tonight? I'm actually doing a play at the Atlantic right now. Not right now. Right now I'm hanging with you. But like uh, <laughs> today's our day off. But uh, tomorrow I'll be at the Atlantic. Hold on to me, darling. Hold on to me, darling. It's a new play by the uh, great Kenneth Lonergan and directed by Neil Pepe, the artistic director of The Atlantic. You're coming off such a memorable show, an iconic show. What was it like yeah. saying goodbye to Justified and, and such a memorable character? Well, it was uh, an unbelievable run and, and uh, a pleasure to be a part of it and to, um, to work with all those amazing people, uh, both on and off the screen. So the, I think the biggest thing was that you know, you're just going to miss them. When you get to have a chance to work with someone for that long, when it's all over, you're going to miss them. What brings you both here tonight? Uh, I'm a company member, I'm proud to say. I love the Atlantic. They're doing just the most beautiful work and cutting edge plays, and they attract such great actors. I just ran into my friend from Justified, Timothy Oliphant, who's cool doing dude. a play right now. He's a very cool dude. So it's just a, a great theater, and it's a pleasure to be here tonight. I know why you're here. This is your wife, so you Yes, I get to tag along wherever she goes. But I think also we're in it, not I think, I know, we're introducing um, singers. Art, it's okay to talk about yeah. Artists who are our favorite singers and, and why they're our favorite singers. And we get to introduce them and then they will sing a song. And Ingrid Michelson is the artist that I'm introducing tonight. And she's going to be singing a song. And my wife, Mary, and Troy Virgis and Caitlin Smith wrote when they were working down in Nashville. So it's really special for me. You're performing here tonight, Mary Steenburgen was telling me. Yes, I am. Where is she? She's right next to you. Oh! <laughs> the truth is, oh my gosh. She was singing oh, your praises. <laughs> she was singing your praises. I'm obsessed. I'm so excited. I'm so it's excited. a beautiful song. It's so beautiful. I'm so excited. I was just belting it out in the bathroom upstairs in my room so is that your rehearsal process yeah pretty much yeah well i've never said i've never sung the song before so um it's so beautiful i'm so happy that they asked me and i love being part of this world and sang here last year at their other at the gala last year and so yeah i'm just really excited and happy and thankful i'm a little nervous and it's gonna be awesome how does the connection with atlantic theater happen for you um neil and i met a few uh years ago and we've just sort of been been in a perpetual conversation about the possibility of me writing a musical. So, yeah, it's been a long, a long conversation that is ongoing. So, I think one day something will happen. I just have to have some time to do it, that's all. Few shows on television tackle the topic of cultural and racial identity quite like ABC's Blackish. Now entering its sophomore season, we chatted with the cast at Paley Fest LA. Anthony Anderson, you've hit a home run with this show, man. Congratulations. You guys on so many levels have not just made a funny and great show, but a meaningful show. Thank you. Talk to me about Blackish and the meaning it's providing to millions of people across America. Well, you know, when, uh, when we, uh, Kenya, Maris and I sat down and, and you know, talked about what we wanted to do in television and how we would come up with the show. We, we said we wanted to be timely. We said we wanted to be topical. We said we wanted to deal with divisive topics that uh, spark conversations and create dialogue and, and, and tell this unapologetic story uh, or, or the story from this unapologetic character and Andre. Um, and, and I think that's what we're doing. We're going through a period of time right now, we saw it with the Oscars, where there's an enormous racial and cultural divide. There's not enough real diversity happening in Hollywood. When you have a show like this on the air, as not only a star but the executive producer, how much meaning is that for you to be able to put a product like this out? Uh, it, it, it means a great deal. Uh, you know, all stories need to be told. Um, and, you know, we, we were fortunate enough uh, to, to be at a network that allowed us to tell our story. Uh, we've made some strides, but there's still strides to make. Um, you know, you talk about the Oscars, you know, we can't blame the Oscars for that. You know, it's, it's the gatekeepers and, and the people who are controlling and deciding what movies will be made and who will be in them. 
Uh, so that's that's what we have to deal with. Uh, that's you know what happens at the Oscars is just a byproduct of uh, what isn't happening on the executive level for uh, for minorities in this industry. Talk to me about being part of the show because not only is it hilarious, it's dramatic, but we, it's also meaningful. Mm. Talk to me about being part of it and the meaning that this show brings to millions of people across the country. Well, I think there's a lot of pieces in that. I think it really, um, we set the stage with the name of the show, um, that the show wasn't called The Johnsons, but was called Blackish, and kind of started to redefine and unpack what that might mean, what black means today. Um, and then, as the, the public met us, as our audience got to meet us, they got to really feel the fact that this was a character-based family comedy. It was about um, a family dealing with what it is to have grown as a human, gained a certain amount of success, and changed as a person with Dre, and how you raise your children. And, is what you want to pass on to them about tradition, culture, race, is it socioeconomic, what is it? Um, and how do you pass something on to your kids and help them be great, better people as they grow? Um, so the combination of those two things sort of set the stage. And then we are a cast that works incredibly well together with writing that is exceptional. And so the, the, the wonderful soup of that, I think, has allowed people to move with us on a journey where we can explore heavier topics in the context of this family comedically um, and still bring people with us. Talk to me about the impact the show is having. The impact the show is having, uh, Blackish is having a huge impact right now. You know, what better way than having, uh, I think it's the number two comedy on ABC right now, where people, prime time, network, where people can sit on their sofas and just soak it in, really get it, some knowledge going on, but laughing hysterically the whole time. I'm going to tell you, I say with humility, I've done 259 episodic television, 65 movies, four Broadway shows. Blackish is the only show that I've done, maybe besides Fresh Prince, that I sit and laugh hysterically. You got a pretty cool show. Talk oh, to me. You. It's got to be a pretty cool experience. Yes, it's a really cool experience just to be on a on a really successful show and uh, just getting to meet all these people and, and seeing all these things and just getting to be different places. And this is my first series, so it's really cool just to know people are watching our show. You're like one for one in this business. How cool is that? Like most people, it takes 20 years to break in. You broke in and you're a kid. How crazy is that? Um, it's just really amazing feeling that I just like to do what I like to do and just um, that people are can recognize kids for for doing the same job uh, for doing the same jobs adults do. So um, just getting to be on the shows are really awesome for me. Blackish is just so great to be on and just like going outside, going outside, going on set and just seeing everybody smile and have fun and then shoot and then more laughs and stuff. It's just so great and such a great experience. You having fun with Anthony and Tracy Ellis? Yes. Oh my gosh. They, they're just so great. <laughs> You guys have become America's favorite new family. It's got to be exciting. Blackish season two, you having fun? We're having so much fun. I mean, I call Anthony my padre now, which is a double entendre because it is both father and padre, and his character's name is Dre, and I, I laugh at that. But yeah, two, you couldn't figure out two people to better work with, right? Than these. No, two. I know we've landed in a pretty cool cast and crew. I feel like that is a beautiful thing about our set is that everybody is so positive and nice and has such amazing energy. I mean, we already are lucky enough to have a great cast, but when you step onto our set, it feels like, even though you're at work and there's stuff that has to be done, you feel like you're welcomed and that people want you to be there. Thanks for joining us for this episode. Hope you'll tune in next time behind the Velvet Rope.